and uh, glad we have this time to study together. We are ready to start Numbers 23. We got just barely ahead uh, on Sunday night, and uh, so we're going to continue with the account of Israel, Moab, Balak, and Balaam tonight. And uh, let's see, uh, Balak, who, who is Balak? He's the king of Moab. Uh, and let me put this map up here. Uh, actually, so this map is, I like this map because it's big and it's uh, in landscape setting. This map is smaller, but it's actually a little more helpful, I think, for our purposes. Uh, I made it as big as I could without cutting off anything. Uh, this is the area of Moab right here. And this right here is where we're going to end up. And in Numbers 25, I'm sorry, my hand is so trembly, I can't make it stay right there. But you see what I'm trying to say, point two. Uh, at the end of that arrow, that is where they will be at the beginning of, really I think they're there for most of this section, but especially at the beginning of chapter 25, that place is called Abel Shatim. And there's only one place in the Old Testament that it's called that, but it is referred to as Shatim in a couple of other places, like 25.1. So... That is a picture of what historians and archaeologists believe is the place of Abel Shatim. And this is a picture, kind of a broader picture, of the plains of Moab. So you'll notice that this is the nation of Moab, and this is the kingdom of Sihon here in the yellow. But all of this was known as the plains of Moab. And I point that out because it could be confusing, because you'd think we're talking about Moab down here at the bottom edge of the Dead Sea, and really they're up here on the northern edge of the Dead Sea. But the, it's called the Plains of Moab because at one point all that had belonged to Moab. Right? Remember we read that poem the other day about how uh, Sihon had come and taken it away from Moab. And then the, the people of Israel came and took it away from Sihon in just one fell swoop. But that whole area, it, well, I mean, and it's, it's not uncommon for there to be regions that are known by name, even if they're within another region, right? We have the Tennessee River, almost all of the Tennessee River is in Alabama, right? But it's just, it's called. So that kind of thing, that's what's happening is that region was called the Plains of Moab, but then it's owned by different countries or controlled by different countries depending on the time. And the other day I said something about, uh, and we're going to talk more about this, about the Moabites uh, engaging with the Midianites. And on this map, it might be, well, why, well, the map I have, which one did I have up here? I don't know. If you might wonder, well, if the land of Midian is down here and Moab's up here, why why are they in coll collusion together? It's a good word right now, collusion. Uh, because Midian goes all the way around. So they are actually neighbors, even though it might not have been as apparent from that other map. All right, so anyway, do you, you want to say anything by way of introduction? No, I just thought I'd clarify yeah. some of that. Um, so I'm just going to leave those images up so you can kind of see the, the setting that we're thinking about as we're coming into this section. Um, now, Balaam is a prophet from evidently up near Mesopotamia. Uh, and I've, I've thought a lot about it and tried to find out things about it. And I don't, I don't know what Balaam was doing prior to when we encounter him in chapter 22. He seems to have some familiarity with Yahweh, the God of the Bible. Uh, he seems to have some knowledge of what God wants and doesn't want based on what we read in chapter 25. Uh, he seems to have some direct communication with the Lord based on what we saw in chapter 22. Um, now, God can speak through people who are not even good people. Uh, so remember, Caiaphas in the book of John is called a prophet because he spoke about Jesus' death. That's not because he was a good person. It's just because God used him as, as a mouthpiece. I think that's what's happening with Balaam. I don't think Balaam is a good person, but he does have some communication with the Lord uh, through all of this. So we come to chapter 23. Now, Balaam has already been told that uh, this was not the Lord's will, but he's been told to go anyway. And so we come to 23, verse 1. Balaam said to Balak, build seven altars for me here. This is on the hill of the, where they worship Baal, uh, which was a Moabite god. It will also be a Canaanite god. But anyway, uh, and prepare seven bulls and seven rams for me here. So Balak did just as Balaam had spoken. And Balak and Balaam offered up a bull and a ram on each altar. Then Balaam said to Balak, Stand beside your burnt offering, and I will go. Perhaps Yahweh will come and meet me, and whatever he shows me I will tell you. So he went to a bare hill. Now God met Balaam, and he said to him, I have set up the seven altars. 
And I have offered up a bull and a ram on each altar. Then Yahweh put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, Return to Balak, and you shall speak thus. So he returned to him. And behold, he was standing beside his burnt offering, he and all the leaders of Moab. Then he took up his discourse and said, From Aram, that's uh, like uh, Syria, northern uh, Syria, which would be near the Mesopotamian River, uh, Euphrates, has brought me Moab's king from the mountains of the east. Come curse Jacob for me, and come denounce Israel. How shall I curse whom God has not cursed? And how can I denounce whom Yahweh has not denounced? For I see him from the top of the rocks, and I look at him from the hills. Behold, a people who dwells alone and will not be reckoned among the nations. Who can number the dust of Jacob, or count the fourth part of Israel? Let me die the death of the upright, let my end be like his. Then Balak said to Balaam, What have you done to me? I took you to curse my enemies, but behold, you have blessed them repeatedly. And he replied, Must I not be careful to speak what Yahweh puts in my mouth? All right, so when it comes time, and I think uh, Balaam is trying to make conditions as favorable as possible to get a curse on Israel. He's offering sacrifices. He's trying to contact God. And when the time actually comes, what kinds of things does Balaam actually pronounce on Israel? Blessings. What, what, what do you see here? What does he say about Israel that is so blessing-y? Well, God is with them, right? Uh, yeah, so first of all, I can't do anything if God doesn't want me to do it. That's right. Very good. What else? What do you make of the end of verse 9 where he says, Behold a people who dwells alone and will not be reckoned among the nations. What do you think about that? Yeah, maybe so. Uh, that they're that, uh, what? Yeah, I, I think that might be the idea of being a peculiar people set apart, not not uh, not just another nation on the list. They're special people. Uh, and then look at verse ten: Who can count the dust or count the fourth part? They're just a huge host of people. And I think this is connected to the promises that are made to Abraham, right? So this is kind of highlighting some of that language that. Uh, maybe not only a, a an analysis of what they are now, but an analysis of what they're going to be in the future. And then he says, you know, if I could go out like Israel, that'd be all right. That would be that would be a even to die like Israel would be a blessing. And uh, Balak obviously is upset about that. And Balaam says, "What do you want me to do? I can only speak what the Lord speaks and put puts into my mouth." All right, Mr. Dwight. All right, anybody else uh, through verse 12? Okay, I think we're ready for verse 13. So this is uh, the second prophecy of Balaam. Then Balak said to him, Please come with me to another place from which you may see them. You shall see only the outer part of them and shall not see them all. Curse them for me from there. So he brought him to the field of Zophim, to the top of Pisgah and built seven altars and offered a bull and a ram on each altar. And he said to Balak, stand here by your burnt offering while I meet the Lord over there. Then the Lord met Balaam and put a word in his mouth and said, go back to Balak and thus you shall speak. So he came to him and there he was standing by his burnt offering and the princes of Moab were with him. And Balak said to him, What has the Lord spoken? Then he took up his oracle and said, Rise up, Balak, and hear. Listen to me, son of Zippor. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? Behold, I have received a command to bless. He has blessed, and I cannot reverse it. He has not observed iniquity in Jacob, nor has he seen wickedness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. God brings them out of Egypt. He has strength like a wild ox. For there is no sorcery against Jacob, nor any divination against Israel. It, must, it now must be said of Jacob and of Israel, Oh, what God has done. Look, a people rises like a lioness and lifts up itself up like a lion 
It shall not lie down until it devours the prey and drinks the blood of the slain. So Balak thinks that uh, if, he, if, if he didn't see the whole multitude of people, then he would come near cursing them. Uh, you remember before the first prophecy, he showed him the whole multitude of the people. And, and now he shows him only part of them and, and, and thinking that if it was a small group of people, then, then he might uh, curse them. But he's forgetting something. Balaam is not saying what he personally would like to do, is he? But he is, is bound by God's words. And, and so Balaam told him to do the same ritual that they did the first time build the altars and 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 make burnt offerings and and then god told balaam uh he said uh, i'll go talk to balak go back and talk to balak and i'll tell you what to say again it, it just it seemed like an identical uh identical ritual that they went through here and so he does go back to to balak and uh and, and of course, that those words there is what God said through Balaam. And uh, first of all, he says, God, God doesn't lie, does he? And, and he doesn't repent like men do. He's not like men, is he? And, and he, when he promises to do something, he does it. And uh, he said, Balaam said, I've been told. To bless instead of curse, and uh, so and he, he says I can't reverse that. So Balaam, it sounds like Balaam really wanted to curse him. He says I can't, I can't, I can't do it. God won't let me. And uh, they, they, he talks about their their deliverance out of Egypt there in verse twenty two, how strong God is, and uh, and and. If, if it wasn't for God, of course, they wouldn't be where they're at. He, they, would, they couldn't have made it out of Egypt. And, uh, but, but anyway, he said, look what God's done, basically. And, and uh, talking about Israel also, how Israel's going to rise up and, and be victorious over their foes. And uh, so you have any comments? No, sir. So, you know, when I look at this, there are a couple things I think are interesting. So, how there are like little jabs in there. So, in the first one, you have, you know, Balak has brought me, telling me to curse the people. Well, here's what I think about that. Right. Mm -hmm. It's like, that's not how I work. And in this one, you have the same thing. Where at the beginning, he talks about how Balak, you need to listen to what I've said. I don't change my mind. And, yeah. You know, so those little jabs and everything, you think you can. Mm. You think you didn't take the situation, yeah. but you don't. Yeah, almost as if he can manipulate God with the sacrifices, with the location, with the, his vision, like where Balaam is standing in relation to Israel, that that the somehow he is like other gods that could be manipulated this way. It's just interesting because I feel like sometimes when we get these prophecies or blessings, I don't know, maybe they're not so specific, but like... Yeah. It's not, not everything's about Israel. Some of it's right. about the people. Like, they yeah, are. trying to teach him a lesson too. Yes. Yeah, it's yeah. yeah. good. <laughs> All right, uh, so at the end of 23, Balak says, uh, let's try again. Let's go to another place. Uh, this is verse 27. Uh, Perhaps it'll be right in the eyes of God that you curse them for me from there. Uh, so they go over to the top of Peor, which overlooks the wasteland. Uh, they do the seven altars, and they offer a bull and ram on each one. Now notice chapter 24, verse 1. And Balaam saw that it was good in the eyes of Yahweh to bless Israel. So he did not go, as at other times, to encounter omens, but set his face toward the wilderness. I, I don't know exactly what that means, but I, it's, it's as if he's not even attempting now to look for signs or curses against Israel, because he knows that's not going to come. And Balaam lifted up his eyes and saw Israel dwelling tribe by tribe, and the Spirit of God came upon him. Then he took up his discourse and said, The oracle of Balaam the son of Beor, and the oracle of the man whose eye is uncovered, the oracle of him who hears the words of God, who beholds the vision of the Almighty, 
falling down, yet having his eyes open. How fair are your tents, O Jacob, your dwellings, O Israel, like valleys that stretch out, like gardens beside the river, like aloes planted by Yahweh, like cedars beside the waters. Water will flow from his buckets, and his seed will be by many waters, and his king shall be lifted up higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. God brings him out of Egypt. He is for him like the horns of the wild ox. He will devour the nations who are his adversaries and will gnaw their bones into pieces and shatter them with his arrows. He crouches, he lies down like a lion, and as a lion, who dares rouse him? Blessed is everyone who blesses you and cursed is everyone who curses you. Then Balak's anger burned against Balaam and he struck his hands together. And Balak said to Balaam, I have called you to curse my enemies, but behold, you have blessed them repeatedly these three times. So flee now to your place, I said. I would honor you greatly, but behold, Yahweh has held you back from honor. And Balaam said to Balak, did I not tell your messengers whom you had sent to me, saying, though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not do anything to trespass the command of Yahweh, either good or bad of my own accord. What Yahweh speaks, that I will speak. So now, and then he will say, I'm going to tell you more about what's going to happen to Israel. We'll hold on to that for just a second. But from three to nine, he gives this third oracle, this third speech. And basically he says, I see what God has in mind here. I, I'm a, a, a seer. I'm a prophet. I can see what God's will is and what kinds of things does he, he see in the future for Israel. Blessings. Blessings. How is that described in these places? Pour water out of buckets. Yeah. Yeah. Overflowing. Mm -hmm. right? Abundance. Uh, you've got like a garden that's growing. Uh, I think in verse five, you have... Uh, uh, just they're they're expanding and they're settling and, and just continuing to grow uh, protected by God defeating their enemies and then you notice verse 9 blessed is everyone who blesses you and cursed is everyone who curses you that takes us all the way back to Genesis 12 where God promised to Abraham that the one who blesses you I will bless and the one who curses you I will curse and we see that play out all the way through the book of Genesis and really the book of Exodus as well and now he, he reaffirms that here, that there is nothing that Balak can do to curse Israel. It's just blessing uh, as long as the Lord is with Israel. Uh, now, Balak is upset about this, uh, tells him to go home. This is not what I brought you here for. Uh, verse uh, 11, I said I would honor you greatly, but behold, the Lord has held you back from honor. Uh, your commitment, and I don't even know if it was his commitment as much as it was Yahweh's control of him. He says, that's kept you from making a lot of money. You know, I was, I was going to make you rich, but the Lord just wouldn't let you be. And Balaam said, I told you. I told you before I came. I sent the messengers back and said, I can only say what the Lord has me to say. And maybe Balak thought that he could work around that, but obviously he could not. And then in verse 14, he's going to begin to speak uh, about the latter days of Israel. Anything through 14? I was going to say so. Nine. Yes. That's, especially the end of that seems like a warning. Yeah, that's right. You know, cursed are those who curse you. Yes. I, that feels like a warning to yeah. uh, To me. It yeah. feels like a warning to me. Yeah, I, I think you're right. You need to watch what you're doing. You know? mm. And then the other thing, like you mentioned this, but the Lord has kept you from honor. It's like, well, we must have a twisted sense of honor if mm. we're saying the Lord kept you from honor. Yeah, like, right. That's good. If money and not being pleasing inside of God would be real honor, then he's just messed up in his own thinking. Uh, you also notice that in verse 9, it's, it also goes back to 23, verse 24. A lioness as a lion lifts itself. You'll remember that from Genesis 49, right? The promise that was made to the house of Judah. Judah is a lion's cub. Who dares rouse him? Some of that exact same language is used in Genesis 49. That's messianic language. That's pointing forward to Jesus. And I think we're going to get even more of that uh, from 15, verse 15 on. Uh, but, uh, you know, we'll... Uh, Notice that uh, the, the allusions to promises that God has made to Israel all the way through in what Balaam has to say, they're just, it's just filled with that. Uh, basically, if Balak knew the story, he wouldn't be trying to curse these people because these people have been in much worse situations and oppressed by much worse people than Balak and the people of Moab, and God has been with them and protected them. Uh, if Egypt couldn't do anything with these folks, then Moab and Balak aren't going to be able to do anything with them. Uh, and so, anyway. Balaam 
he's hanging on, ain't he? Yeah, he is. He's trying everything he can <laughs> to uh, to get a curse. Yeah. All right. I, th I think anybody through else through fourteen or, or through thirteen, really. I didn't really read verse fourteen. <laughs> It, it says in verse 14 that, that Balaam said, now indeed I am going to my people. I don't know if he went back to his people or not, but, but uh, he didn't stay there. If he did, uh, we'll see later on where he wound up. But uh, he said, come, I will advise you what this people will do to your people in the latter days. So he's, he's telling Balak that he's going to tell uh, him uh, what is going to happen to them in the latter days, it says. So this is the fourth prophecy, prophecy of Balaam. And, and it's a message uh, to the enemies of Israel. Verse 15, so he took up his oracle and said, the utterance of Balaam, the son of Beor, and the utterance of the man whose eyes are open, the utterance of him who hears the words of God, and has the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty, who falls down with eyes wide open. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel and batter the brow of Moab and destroy all the sons of Tumult. And Edom shall be a possession. Seer also his enemies shall be a possession, while Israel does valiantly. Out of Jacob, one shall have dominion and destroy the remains of the city. He then looked at Amalek and he took up his oracle and said, Amalek was first among the nations, but shall be the last, shall be last until he perishes. Then he looked at the Kenites and he took up his oracle and said, firm is your dwelling place and your nest is set in the rock. Nevertheless, Cain shall be burned. How long until Asher carries you away captive? Then he took up his oracle and said, Alas, who shall live when God does this? But ships shall come from the coast of Cyprus, and they shall afflict Asher and afflict Eber, and so shall Amalek until he perishes. So Balaam arose and departed and returned to his place. Balak also went his way. So if you'll look at verse 17, it says, I see him, but not now. Who is he referring to there? Jesus, right? He's talking about Christ and his kingdom. Um, that kingdom will come to pass, but he says not now. And and uh, but but the, yes, he also says that that the uh, present Israel will become a great nation and will exist for many centuries. And uh, so and he mentions a lot of other people, but uh, <clears throat> He uh, he says there's going to come a star out of Jacob, and 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 uh, this is the seed that was promised to Abraham, and so this is a prophecy about Jesus, isn't it? Remember in Genesis 49 and 10, this is a prophecy of the fulfillment of, of that prophecy, and uh, that was uh, Jacob's last words to his sons. You remember. And, and, and it says there, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. And so he's referring to that there. And uh, so, you have any comments on that? No. Yeah, yeah, I, and... Since you mentioned David, I think uh, it, it is interesting that in some ways maybe David is a preview of what Jesus will be, right? So that Balaam can look forward and David will come. Second Samuel 8 tells about him crushing both Moab and Edom. But I don't think that's all that this was pointing to because it's going to be even more that, that what David does 
is maybe a, the literal fulfillment, but it's just a preview of the fulfillment that Jesus will come in crushing the enemies of his people and, and being king. Yeah. Uh, because, and the reason I say that is David fits the qualifications here in some, in a, maybe a literal way, but he doesn't accomplish what, what Jacob said in Genesis 49 about all the peoples bringing their obedience to him. Uh, and so there must be more to it than that. And uh, uh, this is not on. It, it was supposed to be on. This red. So I thought I sounded mighty quiet. I'm gonna, I'm gonna. But anyway, no, I don't. I don't have anything other than that. So. We're right. <laughs> Y'all can hear me fine anyway. It's people at home who can't hear me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, we're looking at what, 1400 BC, about right now, 1406, I think, is the date that people give to the captivity and then the, uh, I mean, excuse me, to the invasion and conquest. And then the first captivity will take place, you know, in 722 is when the northern kingdom will go in captivity to Assyria. So, you're right, we're at least 600 years prior to that. All right, uh, ready for chapter 25. Right? Anything else through chapter 24? I do think that this prophecy that you make mention of here, that, that Balaam does, it's almost like Balak is done, and the Lord says, and another thing. <laughs> right? like, I'm not leaving without one more. Uh, so the first three maybe were more directly related to that current situation. But before he goes, Balaam wants Balak to know that this is not just a temporary victory, that in the grand scheme of things, God's people are going to be victorious over Moab and Edom and all those other nations as well. So we come to chapter 25. And um, chapter 25 and verse 1, uh, Israel remained at Shittim, and the people began to play the harlot with the daughters of Moab. We will see later that there were Midianite women and Moabite women involved in this. Now, I think it would be a good time to pause here for just a second and flip over to chapter 31, because this might look completely disconnected from what had just happened. But in chapter 31 and verse 16, talking about the women there, and we'll have to come back to chapter 31 when we finish chapter 25. That's, it's the next thing kind of chronologically. Look at verse 16, thinking about Balaam's role in this. Behold, these caused the sons of Israel through the word of Balaam to act unfaithfully against Yahweh in the matter of Peor, so the plague was among the congregation of Yahweh. I think uh, Revelation 2 also mentions Balaam uh, and specifically related to this. So he knew that they could not, that he couldn't curse Israel just outright. But what could he do? What, what could happen? Yes, if they would fall into sin, then... Uh, they would curse themselves, right? And so it is actually through Balaam's counsel to Balak that this, this process takes place. So it's not disconnected. So ba Balaam is desperate to get paid. Right? And so, uh, and he will, I think he will actually get paid uh, as a result of this. In verse 25, it says he arose and went to his own place. I, I don't know that it may mean that he went back to Mesopotamia and then comes back. We'll see why we, he comes back and we'll see that he does come back in chapter 31. Uh, but it may mean that he's given some kind of residency right there in Moab or Midian. Though I kind of doubt that, at least initially, from the way Balak kind of responds to him uh, in chapter 24. But anyway, so this is really the first time that the people of Israel are um, encountered with Baal. And Baal was a fertility god, and associated with that was sexual immorality uh, as worship to Baal. And notice this in verse 2. Indeed, they called the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel joined themselves to Baal of Peor, and the anger of Yahweh burned against Israel. And Yahweh said to Moses, take all who are the heads of the people and execute them in broad daylight before Yahweh so that the burning anger of Yahweh may turn away from Israel. 
So Moses said to the judges of Israel, each of you kill his men who have joined themselves to Baal Peor. All right, so what have they done? First couple of verses. Sin, yes, they're not, they're participating in idolatry. They're fellowshipping with these, the, the, these idolaters and they're engaged in sexual immorality and they're just tying in completely together with them. And what does God say to do? Kill the leaders. Kill the leaders specifically. Uh, and then he turns to the judges and you say, you kill the men who have joined themselves to Baal Peor. What do you notice about Moses on this occasion that might be a little different than what we've seen before? He does not intercede at all. <laughs> um, now, there will be some intercession made, but it's going to be a very different kind of intercession at the end of 25. Now, maybe part of the difference here is that Moses does say, kill the ones who are involved in the sin. Right. And then it, this is not just like a general plague, at least initially, or a kind of a wholesale wiping out. Moses even sees this is serious and we've got we're, we're going to destroy these people. Um, so, yeah, that takes us through verse five. And uh, in the middle of all of this, the sin and and all that and, and Moses's verdict on this, the Lord's verdict, really, that's going to be carried out through Moses. Then we come to verse 6 uh, and the situation there. Anything through verse 5 that you'd like to mention? All right, Mr. Dwight, you want to take us there? Verse 6, <clears throat> I'll read through verse 9. And indeed, one of the children of Israel came and presented to his brethren a Midianite woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Now when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand. And he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through, through the man of Israel and the woman through her, their, her body. So the plague was stopped among the children of Israel, and those who died in the plague were 24,000. And so uh, here's uh, some uh, an Israelite who was so arrogant uh, as to <clears throat> bring his <clears throat> a Midianite partner in lust, you might say, uh, into the camp of the Israelites here in the sight of Moses. And, uh, and he, adding uh, insult to injury, he he uh, was was acting like you know, you know, he was just having fun time there. And uh, anyway, Phinehas saw it, and it it's upset him so much that he followed them into the tent. It says, and pierced both of them with a javelin, and uh, and and when he did that. Evidently, there was a plague going on by God uh, that was killing people. The plague was stopped. And it says that 24,000 people died in that plague. Yeah. Uh, so notice, uh, well, maybe somebody would say, I think Phineas got a little bit carried away. Can't be that bad. Look at verse 10. Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, has turned away my wrath from the sons of Israel and that he was jealous with my jealousy among them so that I did not consume the sons of Israel in my jealousy. Therefore say, behold, I give him my covenant of peace and it shall be for him and his seed after him a covenant of a perpetual priesthood because he was jealous for his God and made atonement for the sons of Israel. Uh, Phinehas approached this situation. God says he approached this situation just like I would have approached this situation. Phinehas had my jealousy in this case. He had my wrath in this case. And somebody might say that it seems excessive for Phinehas to do this. And the Lord says, no, in fact, this is what you, what everybody should have been doing, uh, would, would have been responding. It, there are times where addressing the sin inside the congregation of God's people actually spares other people. You think about Paul's uh, teaching in 1 Corinthians 5, Right? So here you have a man with his father's wife. And what was the Corinthian attitude toward that? He says, you're proud. I don't know what their pride exactly was based on, but it was something like, we're not doing anything about this. Look how accepting we are. 
I think that must have been it, that, that they were tolerating this and cel celebrating the grace of God, you might say. And Paul says, you should be ashamed of yourselves. In fact, this man should be uh, delivered to Satan. He should be cut off from the congregation. One of the main purposes so the congregation can be spared. There comes a time where the discipline that needs to take place is not just for the sake of that person. I don't think this guy, he doesn't get another shot. Right? He didn't get another opportunity. But for the sake of the congregation to protect it, to keep it from facing the wrath of God. You see, the sin was bad, but when the people failed to do something about it, it was, it was, it was a failure on their part. And it took Phineas doing something about it for the congregation to be spared. And so if there is sin going on and we refuse to do something about it, then we're culpable <coughs> of a different sin, but, but still serious. Uh, now, that idea of the perpetual priesthood, I think the idea there is that he would be high priest after Eleazar. So it, it would go from Aaron to <coughs> Eleazar, his son. We saw that at the end of, what was it, uh, chapter 21? Chapter 20. And then as we come to chapter 25, Phinehas, Eleazar's son, will take that on uh, after him. Any other comments or questions through verse 13, Mr. Dwight? Anything no. there? All right. Verse 14. Now the name of the Israelite who was killed, who was, uh, who was killed with the Midianite woman was Zimri, the son of Salu, a leader of a father's house among the Simeonites. And the name of the Midianite woman who was killed was Cosby, the daughter of Zur. He was head of the people of, of a father's house in Midian. And so it just gives the names of those two who were guilty of, of this sin and were killed here. Uh, verse 16, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Harass the Midianites and attack them, for they harassed you with their schemes by which they seduced you in the matter of Peor and in the, the, the matter of Cosby, the daughter of a leader of Midian, their sister who was killed in the day of the plague because of Peor. So God tells Moses to attack the Midianites and, and, and uh, destroy, uh, destroy them, basically. Isn't that what he says here? Yes, sir. And uh, now... You remember Moses' wife was a Midianite, right? So, um, her father was Ruel. Uh, so we we we've, we've heard about him too. And uh, anyway, other than those, uh, I'm sure he was uh, uh, not hesitant to follow God's command here, and. Uh, you know, that, that does raise, and I think, an interesting question. Uh, there are times, so you think about even when they go into Canaan, Rahab will be allowed to marry in. Uh, Ruth will be a Moabitess. She'll be married and even spoken of very highly and part of the, the lineage. Uh, you've got Moses' wife is a Midianite. The issue is not race. It's, it's idolatry. And, and to the extent that the nations were idolatrous, that was, and, and that, that their sin here was it getting Israel to engage in idolatry. And this is in some ways a warning and a preview of what's going to happen to Israel once they get to the land, right? When, when they encounter idolatrous partners here in, in chapters 25, chapter 25, it's a preview of what's going to happen. Think about like the book of Judges, right? Where they start giving their sons and taking their daughters to marry. And these people, what do they do? They lead them astray. And the same pattern happens. Uh, and sometimes with, with the same nations. And so I, I think that a lot, of, a lot of this is written to this first generation that would be reading, for example, the book of Numbers. And so many of the problems that they're going to face, they have already faced. Uh, so many of the challenges. And this is another one of them, marrying in uh, or I say marrying, at least uh, consorting with these uh, these Midianite, with the idolaters. Uh, and again, like you said, Moses' wife was a Midianite. It's not Jethro, though. He worshipped the Lord. Uh, he was a priest of Midian that worshipped the Lord, and that, that was the difference. 
I think. Any other comments or questions through chapter 25? All right, so I think we need to jump over to chapter 31. We could look at 26 through 30 now, but I think we'll make a little bit more sense to go to 31 now. And this is where the vengeance is taken on Midian. So this is chapter 31. And uh, I'll just read a little bit here. The Lord Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, Take full vengeance for the sons of Israel on the Midianites. Afterward, you will be gathered to your people. And Moses spoke to the people saying, Arm men from among you for the war that they go against Midian to execute Yahweh's vengeance on Midian. 1,000 from each tribe of all the tribes of Israel you shall send to the war. So there were furnished from the thousands of Israel 1,000 men from each tribe, 12,000 armed for war. And Moses sent them 1,000 from each tribe to the war, and Phinehas, the son of Eleazar the priest, to war with them, and the holy vessels and the trumpets for the alarm in his hand. So they made war against Midian, just as Yahweh had commanded Moses, and they killed every male. They killed the kings of Midian along with the rest of their slain, Evi and Rechem and Zer and Hur and Reba, and the five kings of Midian. They also killed Balaam, the son of Beor, with the sword. So evidently he has come back. Uh, and the sons, uh, but not for long, because he's dead. Uh, and the sons of Israel captured the women of Midian and their little ones and all their cattle and all their flocks and all their goods they plundered. Then they burned all their cities where they lived and all their camps with fire. And they took all the spoil and all the loot, both of man and of beast, and they brought the captives and the loot and the spoil to Moses and to Eleazar the priest and to the congregation of the sons of Israel to the camp at the plains of Moab, which are by the Jordan opposite Jericho. Now we will uh, probably not be able to move much further than that. When the Lord tells Moses to take vengeance, uh, is this just like personal ret retaliation or what's going on here? It's God's judgment. It's God's judgment. Look at verse 3. Go against Midian to execute Yahweh's vengeance on Midian. So the difference um, the difference here is this is not about the slight that was caused to Israel. This is about the slight that was caused to God. And God is merely using Israel as his, as his instrument to take his vengeance. Uh, and so you would you think about like Romans 12. Leave room for the wrath of God. Don't take your own vengeance. God says, vengeance is mine. That's not different in the Old Testament. It's merely that God was using instruments immediately to carry out his vengeance. And in this case, it was the people of Israel. They take 1,000 from each tribe. 12,000 men go to war against Midian. And who, who goes with them? Yeah, Mr. Creighton, Mount Phineas back there. Why? Why Phineas? And maybe, maybe I don't know the exact reason, but I think it maybe points in a direction. Because he was doing the same thing as what God yeah. wanted them to do. So, so I, would, yeah. I would want the yeah. one that was exactly right. like God does. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Help us all. So he has zeal for the cause. That is true. What is his role? He's a priest, right? He's not a soldier. He's a priest. Which I think gives us the idea that this is a holy war. But this is, this is a war about faithfulness to the Lord. This is not about territorial expansion. It's not about ethnic cleansing. It is about faithfulness to God in the face of idolatry. And Phinehas being, going out with the troops, I think kind of puts uh, the stamp of divine approval on this it, it, as if it, if it needed another one. Now, they are quite successful because the Lord is with them. Uh, some of that crushing of Moab that Balaam talked about in his last prophecy comes very quickly. Uh, right here will be initiated and they're going to bring back some of the spoil. There will be some problems with that. And Moses will address that as we move on in chapter 31. Uh, any questions or comments before we close now? Mr. Dwight, anything you want to close up with on those verses? Okay. All right. Very good. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks for watching. If you found this video to be beneficial, please follow us on Facebook or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Feel free to share it with others that you feel like may benefit from it. If you need to contact us, please contact us via email at quinn.church at yahoo.com. Also, if you're in the area, we would love for you to come visit with us at one of our assemblies. Have a good day.